All right, good morning. Welcome to Sunday School this morning. Starting a brand new study series this today. Uh, in this class, we will be looking at, I'm going to kind of title the series, Scripture in Song. We sing a lot of good hymns, some hymns perhaps that you won't be familiar with as we go through, but I hope that we'll learn them together. Today we'll start with one that's very familiar to us here at Grace. It is well with my soul. Perhaps you weren't aware of those last two verses. There are six verses in the hymn book that we'll be using to study this and lots of scripture that go along with it. Uh, some good scripture meditations in the hymn book that we'll be using. And then, of course, we'll add some to it as well. So I do hope that you'll join with us in this study. I think it'll be good for us as we sing these hymns and spiritual songs and uh, some psalms as well. Um, I think it will be a blessing to us. It'll help us to be reminded of the scripture upon which they were, were founded, right? They're not just songs that sound nice to our ears. Uh, they're not just words that rhyme. Uh, they should remind our hearts. That was Paul's instruction to the Colossians and the Ephesians, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, so we want to do that. We'll start that study today. I hope that you'll join with us. It'll be fun as we study through these to learn a little bit. We'll learn a little bit about the hymn histories behind some of the authors and composers as well. So I hope that it'll make our worship a little richer as we meditate on these truths. Let's take some prayer requests as we begin this morning. Now I got a couple of text updates this morning. Pray for Terry Gibbs. Uh, she was planning on traveling in today for church and is not feeling well. Gary Johnson's not feeling well today either. Could be allergy-related stuff, tis the season. If your car is not right. covered in pollen, I mean, it soon will be, right? So it could be that or just not feeling well. So pray for them. Continue to pray for Marie Gibbs and um, for others of our elderly folks. We've got some folks that want to be here. Pray that the Lord will give them some strength and uh, some recovery. And that they'll soon be able to join with us. Other prayer requests this morning as we pray. Yeah, pray for my family. Okay. Pray for me and Joyce. We will continue to be an effective witness. Although you don't want to hear it. That's right. You got to keep telling us. Amen. Yes. We need a lot of prayer in our family. Amen. Amen. All right. Got a note, too, from uh, Miss Rachel, I guess, Frank Gillespie, long term, long time missionary battling lymphoma. So pray for him and for his family. Pray also for the. Reese. Reese. Sorry. Jack Reese. Sorry. I don't know why I had Frank Gillespie on the on the mind. But Jack Reese, battling lymphoma, one of our missionaries to the Jewish people. So pray for him, Jack and Sandra Reese. Uh, pray also for Kevin Jones, our missionary to <coughs> Russia. His daughter has been here in college uh, this year, and they would like to get them home to Russia for the summer. So you pray they'll be able to work that out. You can imagine it's quite a, quite a challenge to book tickets um, from here to Siberia. There's not flights every hour. So uh, so pray to be able to get that worked out and be able to spend time together as a family. Pray for his girls there in college. Lots of other missionaries too. Young people growing up. Morgan Dickens. Um, growing up on the mission field. Lord, will give them direction and bless them with continued effectiveness in ministry as they seek where the Lord would have them to serve. Right? So pray for them as well. Other prayer requests this morning? Ms. Shockley, how's your brother? Still? Um, I talked to him last night. Um, he's, he's doing what they're asking him to do as far as his um, Pray for our congregation, some of our folks um, recovering from from some things as well. Yes, sir, brother. How's the building going? Uh, last update, they did not do the procedure, right? Did you get anything this morning? No. No. Um, but that he would be in the hospital, could potentially be in the hospital several more weeks. Yeah. Um, so pray, pray that the Lord will give him some some strength and stamina as well. All right. Welcome, sir. You can sit, there you go, you can sit right there on the front row, Mr. Yeah, yeah, Patterson. Okay, well, you, you messed my fall up today. But no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Christopher uh, Payne is deployed. Okay. And Payne okay. was just telling me about that. So he needs to Okay. Do you pray for Christopher Payne? Pray for our other, uh, and they're serving in the military as well. My son Austin was over at my house last night, actually returning my trailer that he borrowed, and he asked about Christopher. So I told him he was still in the Marines and had been on a couple of deployments and all around the world almost <laughs> literally from Okinawa back to the US and 
and deployed again. So it was interesting that he asked. He asked about Christopher, so I told him about him. We were praying for him as he as he serves our country, right? Praise Amen. the Lord for our military. Amen. Uh, retired veterans as well. Amen. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, praise all. I've seen you sing. Yes. And also, I saw on Facebook this morning that Hope and her little girl Madison got the stomach bug or something. So. Yes. Do pray for something Hope. going around. So. Yeah, and they're down in Texas visiting Stephanie and Derek. I guess so they're going to delay their flight home till Tuesday. He said. So pray for them as well. And now everybody's afraid to get sick of any kind, right? Mm -hmm. So. So anyway, let's pray for strength. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, so well, I think I'll pray for my son, Will, who's up in Harrisonburg. And I talked to him yesterday, and he's taking on a new job in Alexandria. Okay. And he's going to be moving. He's going to start the job on May the 3rd. Okay. And this is a, a big change for him. I pray that I think he's, I think he's calling on the Lord now. Good. Which Amen. he didn't, you know, before. And I know I say, I tell him every time, you know, we'll be praying for you, Will. And he says, thank you. He never did that before. Well, good. Amen. The Lord has to get a hold of him sometimes. Yes, I pray the Lord pulled him to him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He is. Amen. Mr. Campbell? Remember Israel? Yes. They start to fold troops out from over here, Dad. Yeah. You know what that means? Yeah. 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 Pray. Pray for our country. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. The Lord can do mighty things, right? He's not He's not taken by surprise. That's right. His, his arm is not shortened that he cannot save. Right? Amen. For that. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. I agree. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to meet our needs and to meet with us today as we begin this study and to meet the needs in our lives. Father, we do thank you once again for the blessing of Calvary. Lord, thank you for the precious shed blood there that provides eternal redemption for all who will call upon you, confessing their sin and by faith trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. Lord, we do pray for our friends and family and loved ones who need Christ today. Lord, there are many of them who are struggling to find answers in their lives in many ways, physical ailments, relationships, uh, financial and emotional difficulties, mental struggles, um, job situations. And Lord, we pray that you'd help them today to realize that the true answers are only found in Jesus Christ. Amen. And in the truth of your living word, Lord, help them to realize that you have answers to all of life's questions, but they must first trust you as their Savior for their yes. eternal destiny, and then you will reveal to us day by day your plan for us as we seek to live for you. We do pray for these needs we mentioned this morning. Lord, some of our elderly folks need your touch and your strength today. Some folks that are sick and not feeling well, Lord, we do pray that you bring them soon restoration, uh, bring them good health and strength today, and encourage their hearts, Lord, if they're able to participate with us through our uh, YouTube or uh, listening in on the phone. Lord, I pray that you help their hearts to be encouraged by the preaching of your word and uh, the fellowship of your folks and knowing that we love them and care for them and are lifting them up before your throne today. I uh, pray for Christopher and others that are serving in our military. Lord, thank you for their faithfulness to continue to defend our freedoms. Lord, they often go unseen in our daily consciousness, but Lord, we thank you for them and for their faithfulness each day to serve you in the capacities you've given them opportunity to defend the freedoms that we enjoy here each day. Bless and protect them. Guard and protect our law enforcement officers, Lord, several from our church and others as well. Lord, I pray that you keep your guiding hand upon them and keep them from harm's way. And again, reward them for their faithfulness to uphold the laws of our country and of our communities to protect us and uh, to provide for us the order that you have designed ultimately in your plan for mankind. We do pray for our Sunday school class and for our services today. Lord, we ask for your blessing on your word. Lord, we need the touch of your word daily, and especially, Lord, as we meet together here corporately on these days of worship and on Wednesday night for prayer meeting, Lord, we need to know your presence. We need the, the reviving, the refreshing of your yeah. precious word, and so we ask you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you brought your psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and if you don't have one, I know we need to get one of the Pattersons. There is one in the auditorium, and I will be sure to get it to you. Uh, we're going to sing together, It Is Well With My Soul. Starting a new series today called Scripture and Song. We're going to look at about the first half of It Is Well. Some good scripture references there. I hope you kind of got the cadence. You'll see as we study through the lesson today, uh, kind of our format. A little different from the usual quarterly study guide that we have, but I think as you get into the rhythm of it, you will enjoy it. I'll give you some things to contemplate, and then we'll study, Lord willing, the rest of this hymn next week, and then move on to one that perhaps you don't know. 
In Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, there are actually six verses to this song. Uh, you may not be familiar. In fact, you're probably not familiar with verses 5 and 6. Uh, so I will sing them. If you've got your book and you want to sing them with me, feel free to do that. Um, if not, we will learn them. We'll sing this each week or this week and next week as we go along, and hopefully it will be a blessing to you as we learn those verses as well. So let's sing together. I know that you know the first four verses by heart. We've sung it many times. It is well with my soul. It is well with my
If you want to keep a hymn book handy, any of the hymn books here in the room have these first two verses just as they are in your psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, so we're going to look at these two primary themes. It is well with my soul. I've given you several times um, the brief hymn history behind this hymn. And as we contemplate, I won't read it for you today. Perhaps we'll review it a little bit more next week. Um, you know that Horatio Spafford wrote this during a time of great loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. What a series of circumstances. The Great Chicago Fire, and he and Moody and Sankey with the ministry there lost pretty much everything. Um, and then a year later, as they're just trying to rebuild, um, you can imagine the stress that that would be on your family, right, when an event like that happens, and uh, decide to take a vacation, basically a holiday in Europe. And at the last minute, he got called back trying to take care of some business. Spafford was a businessman there in Chicago. And he sent his wife and daughters on ahead. A ship called the Ville de Havre, halfway across the Atlantic Ocean in the middle of the night, struck by another vessel. I think something like 12 minutes it took to sink. His wife was saved, and uh, the, in fact, you can read the history in your song, in your hymn book there if you have one. Um, their daughters were all drowned. The youngest, only two years old, literally was swept out of her arms um, as she struggled to stay afloat there. She was rescued and sent that now familiar text in a telegraph to Horatio, saved alone, what shall I do? Of course, he sailed there, and as he crossed that spot, he asked the captain to let him know when they crossed that same spot where the accident had happened, and as the captain told him, this is approximately the place where the ship went down and your daughters perished, he proclaimed the words that now comprise the theme of this song, it is well with my soul. Um, what, a, what a difficult thing. His life was not over. He continued to serve the Lord. In fact, you'll read an interesting, I won't steal the thunder, but you'll have to read it. He is connected with what we now call Gordon's tomb in the land of Israel. If you want to make that connection, you'll have to read the hymn history, right? I'll just whet your appetite a little bit. It won't take time for that this morning. But, but I do want to look at this hymn. Two primary themes, circumstances and contemplation. Circumstances <coughs> and contemplation. Let's begin with the chorus. If you have an outline before you there, um, if you'll skip down to point number five there, we'll include this next week as well. This familiar theme, and most uh, hymnologists believe that the, uh, the chorus to this was added later, perhaps by Philip Bliss. No one knows for sure. It's usually, as it is in this book, uh, called as anonymous, but most uh, hymnologists believe that Philip Bliss added this refrain, it is well, we often sing with that familiar <coughs> repeat. I love to sing that a cappella. Um, I hear Miss Rachel and others with that alto repeat uh, from the back there. Um, I love that chorus. But what a great theme. It is well. It is well. I'm glad we repeat that, don't you? With my soul. With my soul. And that great refrain. It is well. It is well with my soul. We can never say that too much, can we? Here's some, come some verses, and we'll review these again next week. Turn with me in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 3, please. Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3 occurs in a, a rather, if we want to put this um, with uh, kind of in context, and, and I do mean this reverently, this section of Isaiah is rather negative. God has begun his prophecy through Isaiah chapter 1 by basically proclaiming, Mr. Campbell, the dire situation in their nation. Things are bad, to put it succinctly, right? Yeah. In fact, he proclaims here in chapter 3 some, some rather stark uh, parallels to the world that we live in. Verse 4, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Nothing wrong with young people, but God has designed it that experience 
should lead. And we have a country that is being, I want to say this carefully because I'm not against young people. You know, I love them. We have them in our house regularly and we, we try to, to love them as much as we can and pour our lives into them. But we have a country at large that is being taken over by those who, if they don't get their way, at two or three years old, they never got it. You know what I mean, Miss Rachel? So if I don't get my way, I'll break windows and start fires and set off firecrackers and burn things in the street. No, I'm sorry. That's not the way we behave. But that sure sounds like verse 4. Babes shall rule over them. And if we don't get our way, I'll kill you. Right? Yeah. Yeah, throw a temper tantrum in the street. But the problem is at two or three, they didn't learn that, right? No. No, ma'am. No, sir. Three-year-olds, you don't get to lay in the floor and kick and scream. That's right. Amen. Amen. You get control of yourself. Mommy's in charge. Daddy's in charge. Your teacher is in charge. Right? Amen. And some of us grew up that if we got in trouble at school, when you got home, it wasn't over. So you only did that once. Without some serious thought. Verse 12, again, uh, this, and I'm not slamming anybody in particular, but as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Don't we see that happening in our country? But in the midst of this, I wanted to set the context. In the midst of this, here's God's message to his people. Verse 10, Isaiah 3.10. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him. In the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of this degradation, in the midst of this negative outlook, if you want to put it that way from Isaiah, it shall be well. Let me read you just a brief excerpt. Um, I love to read Spurgeon. I don't know if you read as part of your uh, devotion, Spurgeon's uh, morning and evening. This is in the public domain. I won't read the whole thing, but uh, he had an interesting meditation. Just this week, I was contemplating these verses, another verse you'll see here in Ecclesiastes, but... This was uh, April 14th, actually taken from this very verse. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him. I just want to read you part of this because it's such an encouragement as we consider this hymn. It is well. You can say that with confidence. It is well. It doesn't matter what goes on around me. It is well. My personal circumstances, the circumstances in our world, the circumstances in our community, we know the judgment is coming. This world is not getting better. If you think it is, read the book, right? Amen. And I don't want to be negative, but that's just the fact. But you can say it is well. Amen. Here's what Spurgeon said. It is well with the righteous always. If it had been said, say ye to the righteous that it is well with him and in prosperity, we must have been thankful for so great a boon, for prosperity is an hour of peril. It is a gift from heaven to be secured from its snares. Or if it had been written, it is well with him when under persecution, we must have been thankful for so sustaining an assurance, for persecution is hard to bear. But when no time is mentioned, all time is included. God's shalls must be understood always in their largest sense. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year. From the first gathering of evening shadows until the day star shines. In all conditions and under all circumstances, it shall be well. With the righteous. Right? I won't read the rest of it. But I encourage you, if you don't have it, I'll, I'll be glad to share it with you. But, but again, that was April 14th from Spurgeon's morning and evening. It shall be well for the righteous. And as we sing this great hymn, can you sing with confidence? I mean, knowing from your heart, it is well. Mm -hmm. It Amen. is well with, I like the personal part of this, with my soul. What are your circumstances today? And I know what all of our circumstances are to some degree in general with regard to a virus and, and all the impacts of that and, and the world that we live in and international pressures and all that. But what are your circumstances? You can say because scripture says so, not because you feel it. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but anybody this morning that would say it just doesn't feel well today. Right? All of us could probably say that with, to some degree in our lives. There's some circumstance, some part of our lives that just doesn't feel well, but the Bible says it shall be well in all circumstances. We concluded our um, Ecclesiastes studies just last week with chapter 7, but go on to chapter 8 for me for just a moment, will you? Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I do hope you took time to read through this book if you're part of our class. What a great book. Uh, again, 
we have this contrast in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I like the confidence that it is well with my soul. Verse 12 of chapter 8, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I, what's the next word? No. 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 That it shall be well with them that fear God which fear before him. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of Psalm 37, and I won't go there because if you've been in my class any number of length of time, you know that if I get to Psalm 37, we'll, we'll park there for a while, and I don't want to do that for sake of time this morning, but fret not thyself because of evil doers. Amen. The first part of this verse says, and though a sinner do evil a hundred times in his days be, be prolonged. Sometimes we, at least internally, get a little frustrated with the world around us. The bad guys seem to be getting away with being bad guys, right? Yeah. Solomon says in the wisdom of the Spirit, as he begins again this turning point in the book of Ecclesiastes, it shall be well with them that fear God. That was his conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the W-H-O-L-E, the whole duty of man. Don't worry about that. I use this in broad general sense. Please don't take this personally in any way. Don't worry about the bad guys. Fear God. And this verse gives us confidence, just like the hymn says, it is well. One more verse on our chorus, and then we'll go on to these two considerations. Psalm 128, please. Psalm 128. Great psalm. Brother David Appling is studying through the book of Psalms in his Sunday school class. He mentioned to me this morning that he's in Psalm 119. He's going to try to hold it down in three or four weeks. <laughs> he mentioned that he, uh, he heard that uh, there's uh, someone that wrote a volume on, someone, on Psalm 119, 190 chapters. 190 chapters. And I'm sure they didn't exhaust the truth of Psalm 119. But anyway, we'll go to Psalm 128. A little bit shorter psalm, but packed with truth as well. Uh, psalm 128. Verse 1 says, Blessed is everyone, here's this, the common theme, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. I like this. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Again, what are the two, the two qualifiers? Fear God, fear the Lord, verse 1, walk in his ways. Mm -hmm. And then the psalmist says here, this is inspired scripture, right? This is scripture we're reading. This is God's breathed words. You can be happy. Sometimes I want to say to Christians, it's okay to be happy. That's right. Right? Right. We are enduring to the end, right? right? We're listening for the trumpet. But this scripture and others remind us that it's okay to be happy. That's right. Right? We'll get to a little bit of that theme here in, in our hymn as we study through it. But thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Enjoy it. Enjoy the blessings God's given you. Happy shalt thou be, and it mm. shall be well with thee. We'll review those verses again in our course reflection next week as we conclude our study in this hymn. But uh, go with me now back to verse 1 of the hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Let's consider, first of all, our circumstances our circumstances in this first verse. Isaiah chapter 48. Uh, you have this verse. If you have a hymn book, this is the verse or the passage that's called out there at the beginning of verse 1. Isaiah 48, 18 is kind of the verse for meditation or contemplation. But I want to expand a little bit and look at beginning in verse 16 of Isaiah 48. Turn with me, please. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16. I want you to get the context. God is asking here uh, for some intimate conversation. That's the context of verse 18. This is not a, a broad proclamation from a kind of a celestial podium. This is a one-on-one, a, -on -one, a sit-down conversation. How do I know that? Well, verse 16 says, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. So get the picture. I think it's often important, not often, it's always important for us as we study the scripture to, to get the context. What kind of context is this scripture given and in this case, you can almost hear the heart of God. Come ye near unto me. I don't want to shout to you from across the room. You're not a giant crowd sitting on a, a hillside or something like that. This is, just come here, let's sit down. I want to speak to you. Hear yes. ye this. So that's the context. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, 
the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. I studied this verse out, and most Bible commentators take that last phrase, as the waves of the sea, to call to our remembrance the rhythmic, continual motion of the waves. I've been to Europe, a couple other continents, and I've been to the coast of the United States, both coasts, the Pacific and the Atlantic. And every time I've been there, the waves are coming up on the shore. On both sides of the same ocean, I've been to the Atlantic coast of Biarritz, France, the waves come up on the ocean over there just like they do over here. I've flown across it. I always looked out in the middle to see if I could see a place where the water... <laughs> it doesn't happen. I'm just kidding, right? And they have for eons. Ages. Before we were, and God gives us his context, whatever you can think of when it was, uh, there am I. I was already existing. Whatever you can... As far back as you can remember, God was already there. And he gives us, I want you to see the, the continuity of this same thought. We read three verses that go with our chorus. It shall be well when we fear God, when we honor God, when we put God first, when we respect God's authority in our lives. And the same thing is found here. Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been like a river. I don't know exactly what was going through Spafford's mind when he penned these words, but doubtless when such a series of tragedies happen in our lives, like they did for Spafford, the fire, the loss of all of his goods, and, and the stress of trying to rebuild life in that fashion, and then that the unimaginable tragedy of losing your children in one tragic event mm. doubtless caused him to contemplate, as it would us, right? Am I right with the Lord? Wouldn't that thought cross your mind at some point? And I wonder, as he penned these words, if this, or maybe a couple of other passages that we're about to read, crossed his mind. And perhaps he, as well as we, as we sing this song, when we sing, when peace like a river. Maybe we allow ourselves to recommit ourselves to the Lord. Lord, I will fear you and I'll keep your commandments. I want that peace like a river, but it's a conditional promise, isn't it? He does promise us peace that passes understanding, but he doesn't promise us peace when we're in disobedience. I'm not being harsh, but that's just the reality of scripture, right? We've seen this now in three or four passages. We can have that peace. It shall be well. Fearing God, mm -hmm. keeping his commandments, mm -hmm. following in his way. And Isaiah says the same thing here. In this one-on-one -on -one conversation kind of with God, this come near, hear ye this. God reminds us first that he is God. As we sing this hymn, When Peace Like a River, I want to be reminded that he is God. Yeah. He's still God, just like he's always been. Yeah. And I want that peace that flows continually like a river, don't you? Without right. end. I want that rhythmic wave of righteousness to constantly wash over my life day by day, moment by moment, don't you? And it is at once very simple and yet very profound. Fear God and keep his commandments, yeah. right? And then we can have that peace like a river. Isaiah 66, 12 is a similar phrase in the book of Isaiah. Turn quickly, please, Isaiah 66. Last chapter of the book. God's giving some wonderful promises here. The book of Isaiah is a very dark and heavy book if you've read it or studied it. We studied it with Preacher here maybe a couple years ago it's been, I think. He studied with us through, I believe he began it on a Wednesday night. Anyway, whatever the study was, much of it is very heavy with judgment and the heavy hand of God upon his people for their disobedience. And then as he closes the book here, he gives some promises to look forward to. And chapter 66 contains some of those. And he's looking forward to the day, much of it yet to be fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ. And in the time yet to come. But uh, verse 12, God again gives us this insight into this example of peace like a river. Isaiah 66, 12, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall ye suck, shall be born upon her sides, and be dandled upon her knees. Looking forward to that time when there will be peace like a river, right? The river of God. We're given a picture in the book of Revelation that out of the throne of God flows a river, a continual river. Uh, won't that be a wonderful place to be? In the presence of God. And his peace yeah. will one day flow like a river. But we can have his peace today. Yeah. When? I like the very first word of this hymn. When? Peace. It doesn't have to be an if. It can be a when. We see from scripture it's very simple. And yet at the same time very profound. Fear God. 
keep his commandments. Follow his commandments. Fear the Lord. Uh, keep his ways and his word. Psalm 18. Psalm 18. I love this entire psalm. I've tried to limit our contemplation this morning just to these first six verses. But um, as we consider this hymn, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Uh, what a... Uh, picturesque phrase that is sorrows like sea billows roll I can have that peace even when it seems as the psalmist says here the waves roll over me look at Psalm 18 please with me just the first six verses I will love thee O Lord my strength the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God my strength in whom I will trust the buckler my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Now, what are the circumstances in which the psalmist is making this great proclamation about his trust in God? I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. And then he describes his condition. Notice his confidence in this condition. Verse 4. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid the sorrows of hell compassed me about the snares of death prevented me in my distress i called upon the lord and cried unto my god look at this next phrase don't you like this he heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him, even into his ears. And then he begins a great triumphant proclamation in verse 7. God came to his rescue, so to speak, right? When sorrows like sea billows roll. I won't go into the whole uh, psalm study here, Psalm 18, but most Bible students or um, Bible scholars believe that this psalm was written during one of David's deepest trials, whether it was, and it probably applies in several situations in David's life, and um, you, if you have a Schofield Bible, you have some, some notes there as well. Uh, some believe that it was uh, in the early part of David's ministry or David's reign when he was finally delivered from, from Saul. Others believe that it was um, applicable to the, I guess not reign, but the insurrection of Absalom when he had to flee and then came back. And it probably applies some in both ways, right? This, this principle of he had enemies. And he thought he was a goner, to put it in our terms, right? The billows were rolling over him. The sorrows of death compassed me, he says in verse 4. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid when sorrows like sea billows roll. What was his answer? How could David say, It'll, it's still well with my soul? Because of the verses that precede that. God is his rock. His fortress, his deliverer, his strength, my buckler, he says. As you know, from uh, this time with their armor, the buckler was the part that held it all together. Mm -hmm. You ever been in a situation in your life, I mean personally, where God was the one that held it all together? That's right. Yeah. 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 Where would you be if you didn't have God to hold it all together? Maybe a time of great personal loss, a loved one perhaps passes on, perhaps financial difficulty or challenges, perhaps you lose your job. Lots of things happen in our lives, and sometimes unexpected things happen, right? And we find ourselves, as David says, it's rolling over me, right? I'm going down again, so to speak, right? But God came to his rescue. Verse Amen. 7. The earth shook, trembled, rode on a chair. I love those pictures. I won't read them because I'll get into Psalm 18 too much. But God comes to our rescue too, doesn't he? Amen. And he helps us, listen, he helps us hold it all together. Yes, he does. He is my buckler. Amen. The songwriter says, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. It doesn't come naturally. It's well with my soul. I'm reminded as we look at this phrase of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, it's not just an Old Testament principle, by the way. New Testament saints and, by the way, 22nd century saints have times when we have trials, right? If you haven't had a trial, you let me know. I'll share some with you. <laughs> right? Philippians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul, remember, he's writing from prison. Yeah. He's not in a posh condominium reigning over a far-flung international ministry. He's not speaking 
to large crowds from behind a glass pulpit. I'm not slamming glass pulpits, I'm just saying, giving you a contrast here. He's in prison. Chained to two Roman soldiers who, as their lot of the draw would have it, they get to hear him preach every day. Yeah, they <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Yeah, chained me to two soldiers. Welcome, gentlemen. Turn with me in your scrolls, please. And here he goes, right? I mean, if he did it on Mars Hill, he's not going to be bashful about these two Roman soldiers. No way. And some of them were probably watching the sundial. Why is my shift over? Right? Some of them doubtless were saved. Amen? Don't you believe we'll meet some of those in his, his house imprisonment as you were there in Rome for those couple of years before he was executed? I believe we'll meet some there in Rome, or they're from Rome in heaven one day. They'll say, praise the Lord for this guy. We thought he was a nut. Right? He's chained to us every day. He asked for pennies, constantly writing letters, and he's preaching all the time. And we heard about Jesus. Yeah. Right? Didn't matter his circumstances. But that's the context he's writing Philippians chapter, this whole book, Philippians chapter 4. Therefore, after he tells us about all the things you can read in the first three chapters. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Euodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. That's right. Be careful for nothing. Amen. Amen. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God. Do you notice in your Bible, look in your Bible, does verse 7 follow the first six verses in chapter 4? Most of you are astute mathematicians, right? We love to claim, verse 7, the peace of God. But notice, Brother Cliff, it's precluded by verses 1 and 2, unity yeah. in the family of God. That's right. It's precluded by rejoicing always in verse 4. It's precluded in verse 5 by our moderation and our, our viewpoint, the Lord is at hand. It's precluded in verse 6, not only by our prayer and supplication, but our lack of worry, exchange for prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Then he says, and, is that the way the verse begins in your Bible? Yeah. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That sounds like it is well, doesn't it? Yeah. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Notice verse 9 says the things which ye have learned. And received and heard. Verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last, at the last, your, the, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of one. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul, how did you learn that? Well, the unity he mentions in verses 1 and 2, the rejoicing in every circumstance that he mentions in verse 4. The thankfulness for those around him in his prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. He's learned it through knowing the peace of God when he does rejoice and he's thankful and he makes his prayer and supplication. He's learned that through thinking on these things that we read in the familiar verse 8. He's learned these things by the study of the scripture, the things that you've heard and been taught. Mm -hmm. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Not that I speak in respect of one. For I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Then he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. We love as well, and nothing wrong with it, we love as well to quote verse 13. But as I, as I look at my Bible, verse 13 is preceded by 12 other verses, Miss Pam. Pretty good, right? Did the math in my head. All of those things. Then Paul says, I can do all things. 
And I'm inter interested to, to note, and I'll move on here in just a second, that Paul says in these verses where he speaks of his own commitment to contentment, is like what I, what I like to call it, his commitment to contentment, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, that he's learned how to be content when he abounds as well as when he's abased. Sometimes in our lives, it's harder to be content when we're blessed than it is to, to say, at least, that we're content when we do without. We witness this in the world around us, right? Yeah. It's often been said, and I know some, some very wealthy people that are very generous toward the work of God and thank the Lord for them, right? And, and they are a blessing to many others, sometimes around the world. But very often it is true that to a millionaire, how much is enough? One dollar more, yeah. right? Yes. <laughs> often people ask, what do millionaires work on? Their second million. Yeah. What do billionaires work on? Their second billion, right? I'm not slamming anybody in particular, but you think Jeff Bezos is content? Is content? He's always working on something else, right? The guy who owns Amazon, if you don't know who that is, right? And he's a multi-billionaire, right? But is he happy? No, he lost his marriage, oh. right? Ran off somebody else. Is he happy? Yeah. Not really. Multi-billionaire, but he's not really happy. Elon Musk, he's got an electric car company, Tesla, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with Elon Musk. He founded Tesla. Electric car, you see him everywhere now. So he plugged in his sheets. Every time I turn around, it's four or five of them plugged in his sheets. He has a space company, right? SpaceX, you know, the thing that launched a couple months ago. I watched it. What, what a great ride that would be. Those eight minutes. If I had one wish in this human life, it would be that eight-minute ride to space. Just, I mean, that would, Robin thinks I'm crazy, but that would be, I'm a pilot, so some of that goes along with that, but man, what a rush that would be. He owns a space company, and he's looking at a couple other things, right? He wants to dig, dig tunnels under the city of L.A., all kind of crazy stuff. Is he content? No. Sometimes in a good way, right? He's always pursuing something else, but Paul says, I've learned to be content when I abound as well as when I'm abased. The songwriter puts it this way, whatever in my life that was taught me to say. Horatio Spafford had learned that. He was a wealthy businessman, contributed to the work of Moody, right? Was instrumental in some ways in the founding and sustainability of Moody Bible Institute, which put out some great evangelists like Billy Sunday and many others, right? We have many hymns written uh, from that era of our uh, Bible history or, or our church history, right? And then he lost everything. So Spafford could say, whatever my lot. He had a wonderful family, three beautiful daughters, and then the next telegram, they're gone. Oh, yeah. I've learned to be content. He had to learn it, right? Yeah. By blessing and by trial. Yeah. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. What a great, what a great verse of this hymn. The next verse leads us to number two on our outline, and we'll do this quickly. Contemplation. Not only circumstances, but contemplation. Sometimes, and perhaps this happened in Spafford's life, perhaps he had as he took that boat ride across to join with his wife, and as he contemplated, as he crossed that night, the same spot where the tragedy has happened, he had some time to stop and think. It's a difficult thing to do in our world, isn't it? Some of us, present company excluded, Miss Rachel, like to be doing stuff all the time, right? Somebody's pointing at you, right? <laughs> Six o'clock in the morning is not early enough to get started because there's something I could be doing before that, right? And I got a list. I said, I'll die with a list, right? I've got live in the land of 10,000 projects. But sometimes we need, the psalmist encourages us to do this many times. Sometimes we need to pause and let the Lord speak. I've said this before in this Sunday school class and other studies. Sometimes one of the greatest challenges in the world that we live in as Christians is just taking the time to listen. I, I love to read and study. I could do that for hours a day if I had it. I love to pray. I don't pray as much as I should. I don't take the time. I, should, I was going to say I don't have the time, but I just don't take the time to pray as much as I should. But, but I love to study and I love to pray. One of the biggest challenges for me, and I think I challenged you to do this as a class before, and it's about time to do it again, right? In your personal devotion time, carve out five minutes at the end just to wait for the Lord to speak. Don't read. Don't study, don't listen to music, don't pray, just be quiet. You know how long that five minutes is, Miss Rachel? It seems like days. And you will be amazed. And it's hard to do, right? 
because you sit there and then within about 35 seconds, if you're like me, your mind's wandering, right? Even your mind's wandering on things that you just read and studied. And you just want to say, Lord, Lord, I just want to be quiet. The psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we want God to catch up with us, right? All right, God, I'm off and running. I'd like you to be with me today. <laughs> and we're out the door sloshing the coffee behind us, right? Be still, the psalmist says. Be quiet. Try that sometime this week. But we need some time for contemplation. Here's the way Paul puts it. He has some great reflections as he writes this letter to the Corinthians. Chapter 12, first of all. <clears throat> great personal testimony he gives there. You know, he, he was caught up when he believes that's when he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. He gets down to verse 6. And this is what he said. 2 Corinthians 12, 6, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth, seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I have besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. We could continue reading there. But he had been through some of those things. And perhaps Spafford had as well when he penned those words, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, Paul had this assurance, my grace is sufficient for thee. What had Paul been through? We'll turn back to one page in your Bible, please, chapter 11. I'll read this quickly. I won't take much time to comment on it, but you've read this before. What was Paul speaking about in chapter 12 when he said he had persecutions and distresses and trials? Well, here's just the, the Cliff's Notes list of the things he had been through. Are they ministers of Christ? Verse 23. Uh, start verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Here's how he was a minister for Christ. Here, here's his, his calling card, so to speak. Those trials he's talking about in chapter 12. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aratus, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me, that, or I will form with the army. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hand. Though Satan should buffet, mm -hmm. though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control. Did Paul stop? No. Why? Because he learned that God said, my grace is sufficient. In your weakness, they'll see the strength of Christ. So mm -hmm. Paul said, I'll glory in my weakness. I'll glory in my infirmities. Not in anything I've done. But I'll glory in all the things, and in the things that he doesn't take away. You ever ask God to take something out of your life, or take someone out of your life, and God leaves them there? Paul says, I'll glory in that, because it shows the strength of Christ. It shows the measure of his grace in my life. So here's a difficult thing, perhaps we can pray with Spafford. Though Satan should buffet, Lord, don't take away 
the infirmities. Lord, this is a tough thing to pray. And don't pray unless you mean it. Lord, don't take away the pain. Just help me to know your grace. Right? It's a tough thing to do. I think that's what Spafford did. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. We've got a couple passages quickly, please, with me. Ephesians chapter 2. I kind of like that clock because just as the Sunday school hour ends, the glare covers up the, some, the minute hand and I can't see what time it is. So that works out really well. Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate. On top of all the things that Paul described, the most helpless estate we ever find ourselves in is that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. You could go through all the shipwrecks and stonings of Paul, the imprisonments, the, the, the uh, betrayal that he went through. He says, everybody was against me, right? My own people, enemies, city, country, wherever. But the most serious need that we have, our helplessness is our helplessness when we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Mm -hmm. And God is the only one that has an answer for that. Ephesians chapter 2. And you, as he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, praise the Lord, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Amen. And that not of yourselves, Christ Amen. hath regarded my helpless estate. Amen. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, That's right. created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Christ hath regarded my helpless estate. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, I love this, look at this phrase, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You know what that word nigh means? It means right up next to. Mm -hmm. Like Josiah said next to the Lord, that's nigh. God doesn't save us and then hold us in arms like, okay, you're saved, but you're going to live on the fringe of heaven. No, I can come right up to him today and say, Abba, Father, right? We're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. I have been made nigh. Have you been made nigh this morning by the blood of Christ? Uh, look at me quickly. We won't get to Revelation chapter one, but do with, look at me at Colossians chapter one. I think that Revelation one passage is in your is in your uh, hymn book text. There you can study it. But look with me just these couple of verses in Colossians, and we'll be done. I promise. Colossians chapter one verse twenty. Hath shed his own blood for my soul. Where does that come from? Verse twenty of Colossians one. Having made peace. Through the blood of his cross. Is the blood necessary? Absolutely. It's not just the death of Christ. It's the blood of Christ. He Amen. declared in the Old Testament Leviticus, the life of the flesh is in the blood. He shed his blood for my life. Through the blood of his cross. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated, sometime alienated the enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now with he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He had to die and he had to shed his blood for my soul. How about you? Amen. He died. He shed his blood for your soul. Amen. Christ hath regarded my helpless estate. Listen, I'm afraid one of the greatest hurdles to people being saved today is them realizing they are helplessly, hopelessly lost, dead without Christ. Yep. 
one of the biggest challenges with helping people to get saved is to get them lost. Yeah. Yeah. Christ hath regarded my helpless estate. I hope as you sing these first couple verses of this hymn again, we'll sing it in church here in a couple weeks again, and as you sing it, hopefully these passages will come to mind. It's not just words that rhyme or a nice tune that comes familiar to us. These are scriptural principles. These are scripture in song. Father, thank you so much for this time we've had together this morning. I do pray that as we study the Word of God, it might encourage us. And then, Lord, as we do sing these hymns, sometimes familiar ones, sometimes perhaps unfamiliar or new to us, that we will contemplate your great truth and that it will bring to our remembrance the truth of your precious Word that we've studied. Bless now the remainder of this day. Bless in the services today here and um, in our outreaches around the world through our missionaries as well. Strengthen and encourage your folks. I pray that you meet needs in our lives. Make yourself real and known to us. Save that soul nearest hell today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.